Hello everyone. Uh, does anyone recognize this image? Do you know what it is about? Tower of Babel. Yes. Good. <laughs> so this is the Tower of Babel, and they, the history behind it is that uh, people wanted to build the tallest uh, tall tower and uh, to reach God. And at that time, that was kind of easy because they were speaking the same languages and they were from the same place, right? So because they wanted to do that without God, so God decided to punish them and make them speak different languages. So at some point, they couldn't communicate anymore and the tower was never finished. And apparently, this is the first time in history that people could not finish a project due to a language barrier. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what my talk is about. <laughs> my name is Isabella. I'm a PhD student at Polytechnic Montreal. And I'm going to talk about language barriers for open source contributors. So the Tower of Babel is like an open source project, right? So we have people that want to build a software. And nowadays, with open source, they come from different places and they speak different languages. So communication is very important. And if they cannot understand each other, so we would say that maybe the quality will, will not be good or we are not going to attract and retain those uh, developers. And uh, it seems that non-native English speakers, they might not be confident enough when uh, they are in a very technical environment. For example, here, someone was asking a question and then he said, I'm not a native English speaker. So please forgive me, and I'm glad to receive any feedback and to answer your, quest, your, your questions for clarification. And someone also said in the first uh, line of his post, first of all, sorry for my English. I'm not a non-native English speaker, and I'm not sure about the vocabulary regarding typing. So what I'm writing might not be clear to you. And even if you are a native English speaker, that might be different if you, are, if you come from different countries, right? So, for example, here they were talking about a package manager from Emacs called Straight. And uh, someone said, oh, I'm not a native English speaker. In the title, it seems that uh, this is not a good package manager, but I think you mean the opposite. And then someone said, I'm a native English speaker, but I'm British. So <laughs> <laughs> and someone said, I'm pretty sure it's sarcasm. <laughs> So if you are a non-native English speaker, it might be hard to catch those things, right? And uh, in our context here, a language barrier is uh, when developers cannot contribute to a source code or they have com uh, difficulties in communication uh, due to different languages. And uh, we want to analyze if non-native English speakers, they actually face a language barrier uh, in open source projects. And for that, we need to identify someone's language, right? And that's kind of a bit trickier. So we started from translation. So we mined translation projects that we can somehow uh, identify someone's first language. And we do that because translation is one of the common ways to start contributing to open source projects. And because with that, we can somehow estimate the first language of someone based on the language that they contribute the most. So we mined uh, two ecosystems, Gnome and OpenStack, 14 projects from each other, and we analyzed about 10 years of data. Uh, as a result, we found uh, 549 translation contributors that did translation to 122 languages. So we got those translation contributors, and that was not enough for us to know if they are native or non-native English speakers. So we did a manual validation by Googling their names and going through uh, social media, GitHub, their web page to try to find where they are from or based on their location or in their name. So for example, if someone has a Chinese name, we say that he's not a non-native English speaker. Or if he's in the US, we say that he's an English speaker. So as a result, we found that we have more non-native English speakers than native English speakers. And uh, we want to compare both groups to see whether it's easier or more difficult for someone to go from translation to source code, right? But since those numbers, they are very different, it's not a fair comparison. So we decided to split the group of non-native uh, contributors based on how dissimilar is the, the language that they contribute the most to English. And based on that, we calculated something called genetic proximity, 
which is um, how close, how similar to English are the words in that language. So if the genetic, genetic proximity score is close to zero, it means that the language is very close to English. And if it's 100, it means it's very different from English. And as we can see here, we have three clear peaks for both ecosystems, which means that we can split our data set for non-native English speakers into three different categories, right? Uh, the first one we call it almost native speakers, and those people here, they contribute mostly to languages close to English. Uh, in other words, German, Dutch, and languages that are very similar to that. Here we have remotely native speakers, basically Romance languages like French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And here we have absolutely non-native speakers, which are people that uh, speak Chinese, Hebrew, <coughs> or Hindi. So as a result, we have four different groups, native, almost native, remotely native, and absolutely non-native um, speakers. And uh, we want to see how easy it is for people that uh, are in those categories to go from translation to co-development. So here we split people by different types of contributions. So we have people that did translation and then they changed the source code. And we also have people that just did translation and uh, the native category. For Gnome, we found that most of the contributors, they just do translation. So it means that the project somehow does not retain those contributors to do more technical change. But uh, we don't know what's the goal of those people, right? And uh, we also found that most of the people that do just translation, they are either remotely native or absol absolutely non-native. And most people that are native speakers, they do translation and code chains. And for OpenStack, we found also that uh, it's uh, native and absolutely non-native English speakers, they do translation and code chains, while remotely native speakers, they just do translation and OpenStack. And uh, we wanted to s calculate the success rate of someone going from translation to source code. And the success rate is basically, we get the number of someone um, that did translation and code change, for example, in the native category, and we divide by the total number of native speakers we have. And uh, here we can see for GNOME that uh, native English speakers, they have more than 50%, which is the threshold. We define to see if it's easier or difficult for someone to change the source code. So apparently for those non-native English speakers, somehow it's hard for them to go from translation to source code. And uh, for OpenStack, for remote no, uh, native speakers. So as a result, we found that uh, it is easier for native English speakers to go from translation to source code. And then we wanted to analyze which factors could explain those differences and uh, why, why those na non-native English speakers, they don't change the source code. So we did two types of analysis. The first one was analyzing the GitHub activity of those contributors that did translation and code chains. We analyzed the number of repositories and the number of commits in their GitHub account. So for the number, number of public repositories, we can see that native English speakers, they have more repositories, uh, analyzing here the medium, uh, compared to non-native English speakers. And uh, for OpenStack, is the opposite. However, we only found statistical difference for GNOME, which means that in GNOME, uh, native English speakers, they have more public repositories than non-native English, English speakers. And when we analyzed the number of commits in those repositories, we also found that uh, native English speakers, they have more commits than non-native English speakers for both ecosystems but we, also, we only found statistical difference for GNOME. And that means that uh, if they have more commits and they have more public repositories, somehow they are more experienced with other projects, which might be easier for them to contribute since they have a more technical knowledge. And then we analyzed the pull requests. So we wanted to see if you are native or non-native English speakers, if you have more rejected pull requests, and uh, how many comments you have, and how easy or hard it is to read the commit messages. So for GNOME, we found that uh, almost native speakers, they submit most of the pull requests, and they have more merged pull requests. 
and uh, for uh, OpenStack, it's almost the same, but native speakers, they have more pull requests. Uh, here we have the number of comments in each pull request analyzed. For GNOME, they only have a few uh, comments in their pull request, so we were not able to analyze it. And for OpenStack, we saw that native English speakers, they receive more comments in their pull request than non-native English speakers. And we also found a statistical difference in that result. And then we wanted to see uh, if the way you write your commit message for a pull request, if it's easier or hard to read for someone. So we calculated, uh, we call it a flash readability score. Uh, when it's close to 100, it means the message is very easy to read and close to zero is very difficult to read. So for native English speakers, we see that uh, they have a higher uh, readability score for both systems, and we found a statistical difference. And this result means that it's easier, uh, the, the message is written by native English speakers, it's easier to be read than on native English speakers. So as a result, we found that native English speakers they have more commits, more GitHub repositories, which means they have more experience in other projects, and they also have more comments, and their commit messages are easier to read, which might explain why they receive more comments in their pull request. So we have some practical implications. Uh, we recommend that uh, core project members should look in why those contributors are not progressing to code chains, since, for example, in GNOME we have most people doing just translation. Also, uh, maybe not native English speakers and experienced developers should team up with unexperienced and non-native English speak, uh, speakers, at least in the beginner, to make it easier. Uh, also, they could incorporate tools, for example, during pull requests, to check the clarity and correctness of the English messages, and that uh, might help attract more comments in their pull requests. And for researchers, uh, we could build tools to assess the community members to assess how someone is progressing and whether they are facing a language barrier or not. And uh, one thing that might be a start point is to do what OpenStack does nowadays. So they have a documentation uh, saying that, uh, well, our documentation is written in American English. And uh, we know that this might be a challenge for non-native English speakers, so here we provide some guidelines. So they show how new contributors should uh, work if they have English as a second language. Also, how native English speakers should work with non-native English speakers. And they also provide some cultural uh, things to remember. For example, they mentioned that Americans and Australians, they are more direct to the point, while Chinese and Portuguese speakers, they first list uh, the, the facts and then they make the request. <laughs> so with that I conclude my talk. So we talked about uh, the language barrier, uh, whether non-native English speakers face a language barrier or not. We saw that it's easier for native English speakers to progress from translation to code chains and that they are more experienced, their messages are easier to read and that they receive more comments in their pull requests. And also we provide some practical implications. This was the start pointing to analyze the language barrier, so I would be happy if you have another idea how to measure it and somehow to incorporate it into Chaos. Okay, yes. Thank you. So you have five minutes to answer questions. If you could repeat the questions for the camera, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> there is one up it means that uh, they did translation and afterwards they they did the code chains. So they did translation and then they made the code Yes. Okay. And someone that did just translation, they never they did any code change. Yes. Nice. yes. Um, so I was trying to get your Twitter, but um, the were you able to do in your study? Um, like pro projects that were dominated by non-English speakers and see if the effect was the same, um, if, if it was another language besides English that was dominant, or was there enough of a sample size to make that happen? 
Yeah, for now we actually analyze English projects. We intended to analyze, for example, Chinese projects to see how hard it is for them to attract uh, people, but we could not find enough data since we start with translation projects sure. with other languages, but uh, we intend to do that. Okay. Yeah. Could you show slide 24? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there I was wondering for GNOME, uh, why, so, uh, so it, something that seems for me counterintuitive is that the absolutely non-native speakers in GNOME, they are closer to the native ones than the almost and remotely native ones. What would yes. be the explanation for that? Uh, it might be that they have, for example, short uh, messages or they just write the title of the pull request and that somehow the metric cannot capture it. And then in the beginning there was just another question, which is the, um, the way in which you define whether a language is closer to the other, so it's mm -hmm. this kind of which the, uh, this, uh, gene based. Uh, this one? <laughs> yeah, so how do you define, how is genetic proximity in fact uh, measured? How do you know if a language is closer to another? So it's uh, based on linguistics, they have some metrics, so they compare if the words are similar and uh, yeah, how is similar? So I don't know if you have uh, the word party in English, how is party in Portuguese, in French, okay. Chinese, and uh, genetically speaking. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a question actually related to this. So where do you classify the Indian developers? Because their language is uh, Hindi, but uh, most of them consider themselves as the uh, like native English, and a lot of open source contributors are actually come from that part of the world. So this is actually uh, the language that they contribute the most. Mm -hmm. So if in our manual classification we say that they are non-native English speaker, but the language that they contribute the most is Hindi, so they will be here. But the la if the language they contribute the most is English, they will be here. Yes. And then another question is, so for instance, I think it's really nice that people with different open source projects are aware that the language they use should use something very simple and don't use a lot of abbreviation. But uh, is it important to have somebody who contribute translation to transfer into a code contribution? Because the whole idea of having uh, the inclusive community, so people play different parts to, to roll the project. So it's one, one point, but it's also important to have people who do documentation uh, yeah, sure. that, that then code. So I wonder if it's the whole idea to transfer all the <coughs> non-code contributors to become a code contributors. Yeah, it, uh, we don't know for now if it's their goal yeah. to do coaching, so that's something we should look into. But uh, it might be also that uh, they don't have the technical knowledge or the experience to go forward if they want to. So that's something we want to do. Um, you mentioned the example you gave about the like, kind of language kerfuffle that occurred. Uh, that was more of like an opinion that someone was expressing about the straight package manager mm -hmm. or whatever. But I'm wondering, is there room in, in digital communities for levity and humor <coughs> and even sarcasm in certain types of conversations, so perhaps contributing, maybe not so much, uh, where you're talking about technical things, but perhaps in community discussion? You mean if they contribute more to discussions? Well, just like the different types of discussions that might occur in a digital community. Yeah. Are there places that are more appropriate for that type of language, or is it always uh, prohibitive to building a good community? Uh, actually, it depends on the person in the community, and if they are familiar with each other, they might use different languages. And if they don't know each other, they might be more formal or they do not use sarcasm. And those things are really very hard to identify. So nowadays, for example, for sarcasm, we don't have uh, a lot of tools for that. But uh, we have tools for sentiment, emotion, politeness that might help to identify those cases. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.